हेलो गुड इवनिंग सर हाय 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 गुड 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 इवनिंग 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 हेलो 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 डॉक्टर डॉक्टर ऋषि भी भी है है आई 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 थिंक वी 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 आर ऑनलाइन एंड एंड गॉट गॉट यस यस अबाउट पीपल कैन स्टार्ट द सेशन सो Yes, sir. Uh, just share the link uh, of YouTube on the chat so that everybody can share it for those who are not able to join live. Uh, yes, sir. Can I start the proceeding with uh, Dr. Ghosh? Is also there? Yes, please. I think. Yeah. Sure. Manchi, can you put it onto the mode? Yeah. So, good evening, uh, friends. Uh, it indeed is a great pleasure to have this uh, webinar today. A joint meeting with uh, Indian Academy of Neurology with uh, Movement Disorder Society of India. Uh, we started the preparation six months ago. to finally shape into a very very interesting program today uh, uh for 2 hours and 15 minutes and with me today have a uh, president of movement disorder society of india dr ghosh i think indian academy of neurology has made it a point to have a joint meeting with all the sub specialty only the movement disorder was left and uh, i think in last one year we had wonderful session with um, epilepsy association stroke association neuro rehabilitation association and now today with the movement disorder society it only strengthen the relation between the organization as ultimately we all are one but it is benefit to the large audience of the indian academy of neurology who may not be the member of movement disorder society to get the newer advances to get the idea how the movement disorder is shaping into and how important it is in the practice of individual neurologists as many of them may not be the specialist but yet they need to know a lot of thing about this new coming uh, or upcoming emerging i would say uh, emerging branch of uh, neurology so with me dr gosh is there uh, before uh, i say anything else i would ask dr goes to say a few word and then the moderator and chairperson take over good evening dr surya uh, thank you for your uh, praise for our society and it is my great privilege to welcome you in the joint meeting of iain and mdsi and i <clears throat> sincerely thank dr surya for taking keen interest in arranging such a joint meeting we have excellent speakers as well as interesting cases to present in today's meeting and i uh, convey happy durga puja and navaratri greetings to all of you uh, the great durga puja festival has already started in west bengal and uh, i would request uh, all of you to visit west bengal at least once during durga puja to have the spirit of this festival so without wasting any more time i hand over to dr rishi for starting today's session Yes, sir. With permission of uh, both of you, both the president, I'll I'll go ahead. Uh, Please go. This ahead. Is, this will be a wonderful opportunity to interact with MDS and IN, and I can tell you that we all are neurologists first, and movement is expert expert later later. So this this uh, bond will will help uh, both of us, and of of course uh, everybody uh, involved. So let's start the proceeding, and we have three eminent chairpersons to to look after the whole whole session. Dr. G M Wali. we all look forward to him uh, as a guide as a friend he is from belgaum and he is president elect of mdsi movement of society of india dr gm wali welcome sir dr ajal siwasta who everybody knows that he he is the man of ataxia in india and he is from aims delhi and more importantly he is deep in into ien uh, uh, organization right now and he will very happy if we all get together to make ien uh, the best ever ien con, con uh, of, of the times so welcome welcome uh, dr ajay shivasta and my good and close friend ravi ravi yadav who 
keeps on smiling and and he he is the person who is uh, uh, from our generation taking the flag of movement is our dad ravi will welcome uh, to you and i'll give the um, mic to the share persons to take out proceedings thank you shall we start off yeah, yes sir, you can uh, call uh, the speakers yeah, yeah 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 uh, Again, I repeat the same thing. It's a great uh, uh, pleasure. Next seminar, Dr. Minakshi Sundram, our secretary of Indian yeah. Academy of Neurology, is here. Again, yeah. movement disorder man. So I welcome uh, Dr. Minakshi Sundram. Yeah. If you wish to say some word before we take over the first speaker. Thank you, thank you, President. Uh, it's a pleasure. Let let the academic program. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all. Uh, I request Dr. Peter Swadia, who will be speaking on pharmacological treatment of uh, Parkinson's disease. He is a founder member of the MDSI, past executive body member of the MDSI, and a consultant neurology at the Justlock Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Peter Swadia. Good evening, everybody. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to, to share my thoughts on the pharmaceutical treatment of Parkinson's disease in this August forum. And I think it's going to be a great partnership of IN and MDSI. Thank you, everybody, all the organizers, Dr. Nirmal Surya, Dr. Bhaskar Goh, Dr. Rishikesh, everybody. So without making much ado, I'll, I'll walk you through the journey of Parkinson's. We all know that Parkinson's the pathology starts probably decades before the actual symptoms of Parkinson's are visible. We also know that constipation, REM sleep behavior disorder, and uh, hyposmia, depression, anxiety can predate Parkinson's by up to two decades. The initial symptoms may be motor, including bradycanid rigidity and tremor, and this is what we call early Parkinson's disease. And later on, the patient can move into the advanced phases when he gets motor fluctuations and dyskinesia, psychosis, phagia, and autonomic dysfunction and dementia. The treatment strategies vary depending on the stage of the disease. Um, but we'll be talking about the drugs available, the approach in early Parkinson's, the approach in advanced Parkinson's, and we'll also be talking about the treatment of non-motor symptoms. There have been different non-pharmacological approaches, which is not part of the purview of the talk. In the pharmacological approaches, I'll really be sticking only to the symptomatic approaches which have evidence based to them. There have been a lot of neuroprotective trials which unfortunately have not yet yielded any positive results so far. Uh, Dr. Prashant is going to be taking care of the surgical and the continuous dopaminergic therapies. And neurorestoration, although there have been a lot of trials in that field also, we still don't have an approved clinical treatment in that group. So the drug classes that we have are levodopa, Compton inhibitors, Mauvi inhibitors, dopamine agonists, the ergot, which we are really not using because of the risk of cardiac valvulopathies, the non-ergot drugs, the anticholinergics, amantadine, and even zonisamide. The mechanism of action is really, we can, we can extend the duration of levodopa action with Compton inhibitors and um, AADC inhibitors, basically carbidopa, benzoazide which will prevent the degradation of levodopa, elongating their action. And once it enters the presynaptic terminal, uh, the dopaminergic treatments, we can have MAUB inhibitors that can extend the duration of action. You can have dopamine agonists, which will act on the postsynaptic terminal. So, so there are various different drug classes which will help us symptomatically manage Parkinson's disease better. In the early stages, you can have either very mild symptoms, and these symptoms may not be interfering in the quality of life, or you can have signs and symptoms that interfere in the quality of life where you may require symptomatic treatment. So if the symptoms, the first question to ask a person with early Parkinson's disease is, are the symptoms affecting your quality of life? If yes, if the person is young, you may prefer to use a dopamine agonist as the initial line of treatment. Or if the patient has significant symptoms, even if it's young, I don't think there's any harm in giving levodopa early on. Anticholinergics, in my view, are really reserved for only those with tremor-predominant Parkinson's disease. And 
only after we explain all the complications. If the age is more than 70 years, the treatment of choice is levodopa. Later, we may add an agonist. I'll give you an example. A 42-year-old diamond jeweler from Hong Kong, when controlled with Parkinson's disease, complained of reduced sleep, slept at 2 a.m., woke up at 5 a.m. He binged on food in the middle of the night, spent his whole night doing carpentry. If his family called, he got irritated and upset, did not make anything useful in the end. He often purchased carpentry machinery unnecessarily, had strained relations with his wife. He was on rope and roll, 2 mg, 2 tablets, 3 times a day. He weighed 98 kilos. He often, he was, when he came, he was confused, had a of speech, but his Parkinson's was fairly well controlled. So he really had funding. He was buying carpentry equipment, obsessed with carpentry, had compulsive shopping, and he had been cheating. These are the impulse control disorder problems, which we all know. And you can have compulsive behaviors like gambling, shopping, eating, hypersexuality, funding, which he was exhibiting in the form of the carpentry behavior. And you can also have dopamine dysregulation syndrome. So this is what has actually made the whole world look up and rethink the strategy of giving very early dopam dopamine agonists in high doses, because this can be very, very disruptive. In this situation, rope and roll was tapered and stopped. Levodopa had to be increased. And he developed freezing off periods that were very challenging. Finally, we did land up with an STM DBS. The impulse control symptoms were treated, but the bearing off became a problem. Another example is a young lady. She was 31, Parkinson's on 27, was started on primipexol early, increased to 4.5 milligrams a day. She was doing well for almost three or four years. But then when she came for follow-up, she had slowness of movement, no dyskinesia, some wearing off. At 31, the choice was, what do we do next? We are already on primipexol and rasagiline. Uh, choices add levodopa, adamantidine. Anticholinergic, she never had a tremor, so there was probably no use of doing so. Or add another agonist. At that time, I was still in the phase where I think we wanted to avoid levodopa or delay levodopa. So we added pedipedal. She did well for another couple of, another six months to a year. But later on, we had to add levodopa. And she developed, after we added levodopa, she developed impulse control side effects. She developed hallucinations, required hospitalization for her psychiatric symptoms for almost two weeks when we had to withdraw the dopamine agonist. Finally, six months later, SDNDBS. So, so it, the points that we can learn from these two cases is that Eventually, everybody does require levodopa. Levodopa is the main treatment of Parkinson's disease. When I look back after so many years of being in Parkinson's disease, I don't think there's a very clear advantage of delaying levodopa. We don't achieve much. Impulse control disorders are common and need to be monitored. You have to keep reiterating it at almost every visit. And often the advantages of delaying levodopa are nullified by the impulse control disorders you get later on. And I think with the increasing availability and affordability of deep brain stimulation, one wonders why do we even go into levodopamine agonists at all? Start with levodopa. When you start wearing off, go straight for DBS. So, so these, are, these are just food for thoughts. But the point is that you have to tailor your medication appropriately, but don't delay levodopa and cause a lot of disability in a young onset Parkinson's disease. You have to start slow, go slow, but you have to control all your peripheral symptoms. Many times, the biggest challenge that we face is peripheral dopaminergic symptoms. So nausea, vomiting, dizziness, which can, which can prevent the, the patient from taking levodopa, carbidopa. And that's the most common reason why people come for a second opinion, because they can't tolerate levodopa, carbidopa. You have to give high doses of domperidone. If that doesn't work, you have to get carbidopa from abroad. But you have to do it just to bridge that initial period till the carbidopa builds up and the patient is able to tolerate the drugs. Other side effects that we all have dealt with would be excessive daytime sleepiness with the agonist, hallucinations, impulse control, leg edema. And anticholinergics can cause a lot of set of side effects. And really, I think you should focus only on tremors. And beyond that, I really don't use them in the elderly at all. With, with the experience of advanced early Parkinson's, we move on to the advanced stages of Parkinson's, where you have either moderate or advanced stages, where you can have bearing off, non-motor fluctuations, and a lot of non-motor symptoms to deal with. 
If you look at the Sydney multi-center study where there's a 15 years Parkinson's disease, 95% experienced levodopa induced dyskinesias or dystonias, falls were in 81%, choking in 50%, and 40% lived in an aged care facility. Cognitive decline was there in 84%, hallucinations in 50%, symptomatic orthostatic hypertension 34%. So basically, when you have Parkinson's disease that cross a decade, you have a lot to deal with, and you need to have very careful monitoring of all your symptoms and you need specialized care. So the challenges are motor fluctuations, freezing of gait, falls, dysarthria, dysphagia, non-motor symptoms, and drug complications like hallucinations and pulse control disorders. So we all know that as the, as the disease advances, the threshold from for good on times reduces and either you'll be off or then dyskinetic. And so this is the concept where we believe that the pulsatile dopaminergic stimulation causes wearing off, and that's the role for continuous dopaminergic stimulation, which Dr. Prashant will be talking about more in his talk. So when we, when we have motor fluctuation, we also realize that you can have non-motor fluctuations. This is a general practitioner who I was treating. You can see this is an off phase. He has a muffler. He has socks. This is May in Mumbai, which is hot and sweaty. But look at him. He's dressed for for Kashmir in winter. And when he's on, he has removed all the socks, the muffler, the cap, everything. Because in the off phase, he has, he feels severely cold. And these are the typical non-motor fluctuations you can get in addition to the motor fluctuations. And non-motor fluctuations are common. You can get anxiety, drenching sweats, slowness of thought, fatigue, akathisia, irritability, hallucinations. In the off period, we know you can have motor, you can have motor symptoms like dystonia, tremor, bradykinesia, freezing, postural instability. You can have non-motor ops like we talked, and it may be predictable or it may be unpredictable later on in the disease course. So, if you have to manage your wearing off, you have standard levodopa strategies where you can either raise the dose, give more frequent dosing, or you have a, advanced strategies. I'll be coming to that. So, in the levodopa strategies, you can. Increase the individual dose of levodopa, but that really doesn't often help when you land up with more dyskinesia if you use this. If you increase the frequency of levodopa, yes, you can increase the on time. If you add a CR, that really makes things out of control and you can get lots more dyskinesia. So using levodopa, cabidopa, control release doesn't really help bearing off. While this is when you use IR plus ER in the formulation that literally employs, you can get an increase in on time but not really easily available to us in India. Dr. Prashant will be talking about the option of levodopa capidopa intestinal gel. And for wearing off, you can also add other, and that could include entercapone, dopamine agonists, MAOB inhibitors. And the drugs that we can use would be uh, uh, COMT inhibitors. You can use uh, levodopa com and so when you add a COMT inhibitor, you're increasing the levodopa that goes into the brain and your on time increases. And so the, the advantages increase on time, but you can get dyskinesia. You have to also be worried about abdominal pain, dark colored urine in some cases. When you add a dopamine agonist at an on time, you have to worry about hallucinations, impulse control disorders. And then you have the option of apomorphine, which Dr. Prashant will again be talking about. And then you have the option of MAOB inhibitors. Up to now, till about a couple of years ago, we only had selegin and rasagidine. We now even have the option of using safinamide, and this is a trial. Many of the investigators from India on the trial, Dr. Borgoen, Dr. Mishram, and we can see that with safinamide, the increase in on time was significant. And safinamide is really good or wearing off, but you have to be careful that it can increase the dyskinesias. When you have dyskinesias, you have the option of levodopa. Uh, you can get peak dose dyskinesias or dyskinesias at the beginning and the end of the dose. And these are the example of peak dose dyskinesias. And this is dystonia, which you can get. And this is biphasic dyskinesias. The strategies are different. Biphasic dyskinesias, you really have to treat your wearing off. Peak dose dyskinesias, you got to, got to increase 
You've got to spread out your levodopa and add a mantidine. Biphasic dyskinesias is complicated. If you spread out the levodopa, carbidopa, you're probably going to get worsening of the biphasic dyskinesias. So you need shorter, higher doses of levodopa to take care of biphasic dyskinesias. And the strategies of dyskinesia treatment would be reduce the dose, but make it more frequent as far as levodopa is concerned. Non-dopaminergic strategies would include a mantidine or estradiopilin, which we don't have yet. And the, the concept of deep priming where you stop levodopa doesn't exist. And continuous dopaminergic stimulation or deep brain stimulation can be very, very useful. In addition to addressing the motor symptoms, we have to address the non-motor symptoms like orthostatic hypotension, hypersalivation, where you can use anticholinergics, you can use botulinum toxin, constipation, hallucinations, dementia, depression, and even the sleep disorders. Freezing of gait can be a big challenge in patients with Parkinson's disease. And you can have start hesitation, um, where you can have triggers, where if there's cognitive impairment, your freezing of gait may get worse. You have to manage it with physiotherapy regimens. You have to optimize your dopaminergic medicine to reduce your off time. DBS will help provided it's off freezing. PPN does help, but really it's not an approved treatment at all. And in addition to all the treatments that you use, you must realize you also got to look after bone health because falls are very common in patients with Parkinson's disease. And this is a randomized controlled trial of uh, lisidronate and vitamin D versus placebo and clearly lesser hip fractures in the treatment arm increased bone mineral density in the treatment arm while it was reduced in the placebo group. So it is a good practice to ensure that you also look after bone health in all patients with advanced Parkinson's disease. Cognitive impairment can be a very big challenge as the disease advances. And in the Sydney Multicenter study, 48% had dementia, 36% had MCI, 15% were not cognitively impaired. When we did a study of MOCA versus MMSE, clearly MOCA is much, much more powerful in predicting cognitive decline in educated patients with Parkinson's disease. And the treatment options really are use of donopezil or mean. You can also use memantine as an add-on, which can be used, although it's off the label. And you have to remove drugs that can worsen cognition, like anticholinergics, ensure that your B12 is replaced with thyroid is in control, and also treat any factors which may be aggravating uh, an encephalopathy, like urinary tract infection, bowel impaction, any other infections that can be there. That can also help. Even I think uh, dopamine agonists can be reduced when there's a lot of confusion. So this is a 67-year-old gentleman with Parkinson's of nine years duration. He had bearing off and dyskinesias. He came to the emergency with active visual hallucinations, absolutely no insight, aggressive. This is his prescription, five tablets of levodopa, carbidopa a day with a CR at night. He had Pramipexol 3 mg per day, amantadine 300 mg per day, and brasagidine 1 mg per day. So you really have to start reducing the amantadine and the Pramipexol first in such a situation and also look at all the other factors. So when you have a patient with the hallucinations, you look for secondary causes, the electrolyte abnormalities, dehydration, stroke, uncontrolled diabetes, B12, alcohol, substance abuse, drugs. You ensure that he sleeps. If, if your secondary, your hallucinations don't improve, taper off the unnecessary drugs, anticholinergic, cementity, mau, dopamine, Agonists, pumped, and then levodopa in order. Cholinesterase inhibitors can be used. You may have to use antipsychotic medications like clozapine, quetiapine, or primavanseline, which are all approved treatments. So this is the approach when you have a patient with hallucinations. What did we do in this case? The agonists, the amantadine, the resagenine were all had to be discontinued eventually. Obviously, gradually, it cannot be done suddenly. Donopezil and quetiapine were added. Hallucinations reduced, but the bearing off obviously increased and the levodopa had to be bumped up. So, so this is a very common problem that we encounter. So I think we all need to know how to approach such a situation. We move from the cognitive and uh, psychiatric symptoms. symptoms. When you have gastrointestinal symptoms, you have to treat the constipation, manage the nausea, which could be because of the drugs. You have to treat with the genitourinary and the orthostatic hypotension. 
for for gastrointestinal symptoms you need laxatives you need to treat the nausea vomiting you dumbledown can be useful for the genital urinary symptoms if there is no residual volume you can use tolteridone uh, solifenacin dadafenacin for erectile dysfunction sometimes they are very bothered you may have to use uh, sildenafil or tadalafil for orthostatic hypertension you have to really ensure that there is no anti hypertensive going on you have to use all the non pharmacological measures tight stockings increased fluid um you have to adjust your dopaminergic drugs dompedrone sometimes can be useful along with that midodrine chlorocortisone paracetamol can be required for hyperhidrosis you really have to op optimize your on time dbs sometimes can help for sleep disorder you have to really figure out is it sleep fragmentation or just difficulty falling asleep a levodopa carbidopa cr may help sometimes a night time levodopa dose may help nocturnal arachnidia and may help you go to sleep um melatonin benzodiazepines sulfidem quetiapine can all be tried depending on the pattern that's there for parasomnia clonazepam or melatonin can work and for excessive daytime sleepiness we have to reduce the dopamine agonist ensure that there is no osa component modafinil can help and sensory and symptoms and fatigue can be also very very common non motor symptoms and really often you might need antidepressants you have to optimize the levodopa carbidopa ensure that the bearing off is reduced to help fatigue so i think to summarize the pharmacological treatments in parkinson disease in early parkinson disease the first question we need to ask do we need to treat at all if the if the patient is symptomatic mauvi inhibitors and levodopa carbidopa or dopamine agonists can work in the later stages we optimize pharmacological treatments treat the wearing off and the dyskinesias and address the non motor symptoms and if the patient is not re ex responding i think we need to explore the continuous dopaminergic stimulation and deep brain stimulation fairly early before the patient loses his job or his livelihood or his social life and i think this is very important that often dbs stimulation deep brain stimulation referrals occur pretty late by which time the patient has either lost his job or stopped working or taken voluntary retirement or has stopped his social life both of which are pretty difficult to restore even if you restore his motor symptoms by doing continuous by yes or continuous dopaminergic stimulation thank you very much for your patient hearing these are all paintings done by a patient with parkinson disease just to try and understand that you may have parkinson's but it doesn't mean that you cannot have a good life despite parkinson's disease thank you very much for a thank you dr petrus okay. can i ask a question yeah it's a very lucid presentation uh, of the standard treatment and also the modification you would suggest in a given case uh, any question please go ahead so can i ask a question yes sir go ahead yeah uh, petrus what is your experience with uh, botox for uh, tremor in parkinson i am not very gung ho about botox i think you have to optimize your medication first there is probably a role in those with where you can't use anticholinergics because of age and all but i think it's it's over exaggerated you need high doses repeatedly i think you have to explore other options first botox would probably be my last thought correct and uh, yeah i would also be worried about the atrophy that may happen if you repeatedly yeah, it's it's not a simple thing and you may end up producing a wrist drop we in creep increasing the doses and all that so thanks for those anybody else i think one of uh, sir one audience has asked one question i think yeah. uh, no the rule of yes there are background i think is a very good drug that's there in the armamentarium with urinary urgency urgent continence uh it's being used rampantly by all the urologists luckily its side effect profile is res relatively favorable to parkinson disease unlike the alpha blockers which cause or severe orthostatic hypotension so i have no problem with metabegron a lot of my patients are on metabegron and i think many of them do feel that it helps
Thank you, Dr. Petrus, uh, for the nice presentation. I hand over to Dr. Achal Srivastava for the next lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh, we had a very nice presentation from Petrus about what medicines uh, are required and how to treat Parkinson's with medications. Now, uh, I will invite uh, Dr. L.K. Prashant, a good friend of mine, uh, to deliver a talk on a subject which tells you what are the other options other than medications. Currently, he is a consultant neurologist and movement disorder specialist at Manipal Hospitals, Bangalore. And you all know his areas of interest are specifically uh, movement disorders, ED, genetics, DBS, epimorphin, botulinum toxin, tau He has a good number of publications. And uh, he has got association various uh, uh, organizations. Also, he's an editorial board of many of prestigious journals. So I invite him to deliver a talk. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, you. I think it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, August gathering. I think uh, this is a great uh, uh, theme, which is the IAN has taken up to get all the subspecialities and to make sure that uh, uh, what is happening in various subspecialities are discussed with the uh, general neurology and uh, how to have a better interactions between both the set uh, uh, societies going on. I think once again, I should thank specifically Professor Nirmal Surya, Dr. Minakshi Sundram, and definitely Dr. Achal, who is leading down here to make sure that the things are happening in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, I hope my slides are being seen and my audio is clear. If anything is there, please let me know. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. I think uh, I, uh, what uh, Petrus has done is a great talk on telling about what are the various treatment options for Parkinson's disease, how it is going on, and what are the options we are down, having down there. My topic has been specifically restricted to treatment of Parkinson's disease beyond medications. And uh, this is where... Uh, uh, I wanted to ask when the topic was gone, what should I talk about? I'll just, I hope my slides are running. So when you look into treatment of Parkinson's disease, it's a long process, like what uh, uh, Petras was talking about. The stages of Parkinson's disease are varied from pre-prodermal Parkinson's disease, which goes to a prodermal, where you just get non-motor symptoms to initially to begin with. Then you develop early stable Parkinson's disease where the motor symptoms start coming up. Later on, you go into motor complications phase where fluctuations in relations to medications, non levodopa responsive symptoms starts popping up. Then comes the advanced Parkinson's disease where uh, most of the things slowly move on to the palliative care as such. This is what is the curve of uh, various symptoms, how they develop in Parkinson's disease over a period of time. And when we look into treatment of Parkinson's disease, we are currently restricted to what you call it as a Goldilocks zone. This is the area of treatment what is going on. So this is where a lot of our efforts are going on, how to make the quality of life better, how to make people's personal life, family life better. This is all the efforts are going on. The question when we talk about beyond medications, is it something before this or something after that? That is where the question came down to me. Uh, but uh, the, it's very clear that given the time what has been provided, I need to stick still now into the Goldilocks zone itself and talk something down there. What is happening? Because this is where uh, all of us will be looking into it and the, what therapeutic modalities when you go back as a learning curve to see what can be utilized for our day-to-day -day practice. So what happens in Parkinson's disease? Uh, as Petras was showing clearly, Parkinson's disease goes through various phases, from early stable Parkinson's disease, where we give medications, which is like a pulsatile therapy, you give medications, medication starts working. And then slowly what happens, these medications, which was working initially for a longer duration of phase, the medication effect starts slowly weaning off, and you need to have on-off phenomena. So you have a periods when you get on periods, when medications work, and something in the initial phases, they are very much predictable, However, what happens down the time is these phases starts getting slightly unpredictable. You have a good on period or on period with dyskinesis are there, or some of the times you have more off periods. 
or you take medications and then the medication does not work or may you take medications you have suboptimal loss so various types of complications even though medications are working good the benefits of medications are limited or becoming erratic and you are not able to get those benefits the way we are looking into it so how to go into this how to go beyond medications so definitely when the medications have hit a roadblock we need to look something how we can work around that the best is what we need to do from day one is integrated therapies it's feeling of well being at the end of the day when we look into patients of for treatment with parkinson disease is uh, how the things are going on and how to make someone better whether it's improvement in the self care is improvement in the nutrition physical activities mental clarity sleep immunity community support this is what is required when you look into beyond medications for management of feeling of well being or it could be a complementary and alternative therapies with a country like india where there are so many types of therapy options are available and so many types of pathis allopathy homeopathy ayurveda and all those things being there there are different types of therapies are there which technically is can be considered as beyond medications which can be ayurveda or it can be mind and body interventions such as hypnosis yoga meditations or manipulations of the body with chiropractic manipulations osteopathic manipulations massages what we get or it can be biology based products such as herbal products probiotics vitamins so we know that all of our patients do they have tried one of these beyond the medication medications therapies which can be either be complementary therapies or it can be integrated therapies and definitely this add up significantly to the management of parkinson disease and giving a holistic approach to management of parkinson disease what i am going to do is i am going to specifically stick on to advanced therapies and neither i'm going to go into the depths of the integrated therapies what are their roles currently what are the evidences for either for the integrated or alternative therapies what is going on for management of parkinson disease so when we talk about advanced therapies so this is what we are talking about in the graph if you can remember the erratic responses start coming up this is where we need to treat there are two ways of looking into it one is rescue therapies means rescue therapies when the medications are not working the way you are expecting to work and the problem is happening now so we want something which acts quickly predictably and can have a, a responses which can be used in emergencies this the way we do it giving crushed levodopas or sublingual levodopas apomorphin injections or intranasal sprays which are available now. or people need to have much more stable responses throughout the day where our regular medications are not giving those stable responses this is where we move on to our continuous dopaminergic therapies and what is continuous dopaminergic dopaminergic therapies when you look into continuous dopaminergic therapies this is something which works much more stably much more continuously whole throughout the day without much of erratic responses and what comes for the role here is dbs apomorphin pumps diodopas that is levodopa carbidopa intestinal gels and patches such as rotigotone patches so these are for our what you call it as continuous dopaminergic therapies for patients with parkinson disease i am still going to narrow down here for my talk so that we'll stick to things what we are what we practice in india what we need to work on so what is happening in parkinson disease is you get good responses initially people have very good responses this is the therapeutic window the two black lines what you are looking down there over a period of time when the medication start increasing people start hitting up and down so they have on periods with dyskinesias or off periods with significant and then associated with that you can also notice that over a period of time the frequency of medication starts increasing with erratic responses starts happening now we want something which moves on from this once again back to this therapeutic window period and to have a stable responses currently in india for this these therapies we are having two major therapy options available one is apomorphin and second is dbs or deep brain stimulation i'm going to talk about uh, these two uh, uh, interventions what we are having for parkinson disease and which are commonly available currently in india and what are the evidences for them and how things are going forward for them so what is apomorphin so when did apomorphin came into the market if you look into apomorphin apomorphin is something not new even though the apomorphin is available in indian market only for last 2 to 3 years 
Upper Marfan is well known for centuries. Probably it has been well utilized from the Egyptian era, where it was used as one of the, what you call it as uh, probably in the Egyptian lotus, the blue lotus is one. This is where it has been used, where people used to be used. It's one of uh, uh, aphrodisic or hallucinogenic compounds initially to begin with. Even if not in Egyptian, in Indian literature also, you can see that uh, uh, utilization of apomorphine has been, means utilization of apomorphine or, or uh, what you call it as uh, uh, blue lotus has been deposited in Indian literature, especially it comes in the Buddhists where Indian literature goddess Tara has been deposited on blue lotus. She has been deposited of calmness, uh, sleepiness and all those things. So it means that people knew some of the usages of apomorphine or apomorphine derivatives for many centuries to go ahead. It is not something which is completely came into the market as fresh, which is not known to anyone. But the main trend in the apomorphine started to come in late 1840s when the first time synthetically apomorphine was, was produced. And after that, it has been used for various purposes. I think for Parkinson's disease, it came quite la later on during that time. Apomorphine is linear utilization, even though it is in a, what you call it as a potent dopamine agonist, what we are looking down, it is used, its uh, uh, effects are used as a emetic properties. It is used as a hypnotic and sedatives for various conditions. It is used for sexual dysfunction, for erectile dysfunction and female sexual dysfunction. And definitely it is used for movement disorders, especially Parkinson's disease, in addition to other movement disorders where it has been tried. And it is also being tried in whereas other uh, newer future endeavors is going on to look into minimal conscious states and for neuroprotections, for Alzheimer's and for ALS disorders. So if you look into where apomorphine is being tried, utilizations are being looked at, the, the, the uh, options where at all it has been used is enormous. This is what is going on. So how does it work? So this is one of the videos. So what happens down here is, this is a patient with Parkinson's disease uh, who is having uh, severe off times. And the advantage of apomorphine is you give a subcutaneous uh, infusion of upper, injection of apomorphine, similar to insulin injection, within about few minutes, four to five minutes in this patient, what you can see that there's a dramatic predictable response talk starts coming. So these responses are dramatic and people will have very good improvement going on. And this effect lasts for about 45 minutes to one and a half hours, varying from person to person. This utilization uh, helps people to overcome their sudden off periods, unpredictable offs, where they can just carry a pen in their pockets and take the injections as and when required. The main question comes is, in spite of this molecule being for such a long time, in spite of having such a good responses, why it has not been in the mainstream of therapy for so many years? So you can look upper morphine as something like a wrong time, wrong place type of a drug. So if you look into it, the utilization of upper morphine was acknowledged in early 1950s and 60s. But this was the same time when apomorphine had to compete with levodopa. The oral ingestion of apomorphine was associated with severe gastric issues, especially nausea, vomiting. And that is why it was pushed down back. That is why it was not utilized uh, at that point of time. So, and when the levodopa started to come into it as a new molecule, all the efforts are into levodopa to see how it can be worked to make it work, work around the levodopa. Then, it didn't lose its race. In 1970s, dopamine came when, the, uh, uh, when uh, dom domperidone was discovered. And with the discovery of domperidone, what happened was it came to know that apomorphine can be used better with a better effect, with lesser side effects for the GI issues. However, what was the time in 1970s? This was the tenure where dopamine agonist and newer molecules started to come. So once again, apomorphine, which didn't have its own, uh, what you call it as IP rights, it was never been able to take the main uh, mainstream of the therapies. Later in 1980s, uh, apomorphine had to compete with DBS. Even though apomorphine improved itself by coming from oral tablets to injections, now in the 1980s, the pumps came in, which was a better deliverable, predictable responses However, this was the tenure when it had to compete with DBS and that is where once again it went back to its 
uh, what you call it, is putting back in the shelf. That is what has been happen, happened. What you can see is in spite of being there, in spite of being pushed every decade for, with various newer therapies coming into role, it has been able to hold its place. It has been able to overcome the competitions and has been able to show that it is still has some place for treatment of Parkinson's disease. So how is the evidence? Is there a sufficient evidence for us to prove that? So what are its long-term users? What are its effects on nocturnal issues, combinations, other advanced therapies, and axial issues, what you can look into it. Most of the studies which have looked into management of Parkinson's there are significant motor fluctuations and levodopa-induced dyskinesias were noticed. And these were also the subset of patients in whom DBS was contraindicated either due to cognitive deficits or considerable axial symptoms. And apomorphine was utilized in these studies. And this was not a study for lasting for one month, two months, or three, few months. This was long-term studies where people were given apomorphine pump therapies over a, a periods extending up to 12 years. And they have been able to show consistently that continuous subcutaneous apomorphine infusion significantly improved the motor fluctuations and reduced the dyskinesias in all these patients. Not only that, because when this was apomorphine was utilized in patients who were having cognitive deficits because DBS was not being able to be done in those subset of patients. And they wanted to see how the, uh, how the cognition and behavioral aspects were affected. Inherently, the output of the papers was due to selection criteria. The patients were, were on uh, apomorphine infusion pump therapies. What they could notice that patient didn't have any significant worsening in those who had mild to moderate cognitive issues going on. Yes, people with significant issues, we do have problems going on. They did notice that there was not no worsening of neuropsychological battery when they compared head-on head in patients with DBS as against with only apomorphine pump therapies. And in patients who had visual hallucinations, specifically when they looked into it, they noticed that either the visual, pre-existing visual hallucinations remained stable or slight improvement, only a small subset of patients had worsening of visual hallucinations with apomorphine pump therapies. So it does notice that, yes, it has some role in patients in whom DBS is contraindicated for either for cognitive issues or behavioral issues. Not only that, apomorphine is being tried for axial issues, especially patients with severe camptochromia, and it has been shown that camptochromia do gets benefited in certain subset of patients with uh, with Parkinson's disease. Recently, the pre till now, the most of the trials were limited to daytime utilization of the apomorphine pump therapies. However, recently, the new study which has come, the apomorphine study, which is published recent in the Lancet in 2022, a double blind study, they have clearly shown that apomorphine can also be used for nocturnal issues and to improve significantly sleep related events. And people can have better benefits not only for the daytime symptoms even for the nocturnal issues as such. It has been compared uh, with other continuous dopamine stimulation therapies. Uh, the I think pro prominently I should talk about the Euroin 1 and Euroin 2 studies, uh, which are the pioneer studies by Professor Ray. I think uh, that this is what we should remember, one of the Indians who is uh, actively contributing to these studies as such. And they have been able to show that the both all the therapies had good benefits, especially into motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. And all these therapies had a good effects on quality of life and motor symptoms. When they compared apomorphine with duodopa and DBS, each one of these therapies had a better benefit with certain domains. And in that way, apomorphine had a better benefit in patients with neuropsychological, neuropsychiatric outcomes, especially on NMS and PDQ8, when compared to the IJLI inhibitors. It indicates that certain subset of patients, based upon what set of symptoms they're having, different types of uh, CDS therapies have a different role and outcomes for these patients when we look into management of these patients. Probably in brief, what I can tell is apomorphine is a uh, medication with multiple phases. It has multiple roles across spectrum of medical disorders, and it is mostly under-marketed due to no exclusivity of rights of an age-old drug. It has variable indications in Parkinson's disease from rescue therapies to have benefits with continuous dopaminergic therapies. And not only that, even for patients with non-motor symptoms, it does have a significant effect. 
are significant beneficial. Probably whether the coming decade can be finally of apomorphin, we can look into it down the time as such. Now, coming into the gold standard for treatment of motor complications in Parkinson's disease, that is deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation, we all know is stimulation of the brain. Uh, for the people who are uh, students who are there in this uh, session here, uh, what is deep brain stimulation? Deep brain stimulation involves putting a pacemaker into the brain where uh, two electrodes are put into either to subthalamic nucleus or globus pallidus interna. And this pacemaker is being stimulated with a pulse generator, which is usually kept on the infraclavicular region on the chest. What we are trying to do is with this, we are trying to stimulate certain parts of the brain to work it better. And since the early 1980s, even though the, the, the deep brain stimulation concepts was well known, the role of deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease came well in 1980s, thanks to Ben Abid and others, Professor Ben Abid and others. So where uh, dramatically the role of deep brain stimulation changed. It does have dramatic and predictable responses, what you can notice. Patients who have severe hypokinesia or bradykinesia, patients with tremors, within few seconds of starting the DBS, patients' improvements, clinical improvements become very dramatic. You can see this in this video, this is a patient who has severe bradykinesia, with a significant difficulty in movement. And this is a video of a person who is having severe tremors. And what you can see is within a few seconds, when I put on the DBS on, both bradykinesia dramatically improves and the tremor almost vanished down there. Not only that, the tremor didn't vanish, you can also notice that you have developed dyskinesis of the leg. And you can see the bradykinesis so much dramatic. This dramatic improvement, what we can see in DBS, probably is something which is eye-catching and it is definitely significant, helpful for the patients when things start improving for them. The question is, how does the DBS work? I think this is uh, probably in a most enigmatic question where a lot of things are being going on, a lot of postulations are there, and there are evidences to pr prove each one of those uh, postulations, and there are evidences which are against those postulations. The commonly put forward postulations for deep brain stimulation to work concepts are direct inhibition of the neural activity, direct excitation of the neural activity, there is information lesion, that is jamming of the information, and synaptic filtering. This is what you can try to remember how the DBS works for patients with Parkinson's disease. What are the concepts? There is things going on into it. I am not going to go into each one of the detail how uh, DBS helps for various symptoms, but to tell that uh, probably I can't uh, stress anything less that DBS currently remains a gold standard for management of patients with moderately advanced Parkinson's disease. This is one of the major reviews. I would suggest everyone to read this, which has recently published by Latchmeyer et al. Uh, and they have looked into how deep brain stimulation has been going on over the years. In this table, what you can notice that they have tried to compare what is the data from 1993 to 2004 as against 2005 to 19, and then as against with the SPN versus global GPI stimulations. What you can notice is the age of surgery, what is happening down, operations has slowly in reducing down. People who had initially was almost around 60 years, coming 58 to 50 is, the, uh, is increasing from, the cutoff duration is increasing from 50s to late 60s and early 70s nowadays. And the disease duration, initially you can notice the disease duration was around almost like 14 years before the DBS was being considered which has dropped down to around 11 years. And now currently, uh, people we are looking at around four to five years at the onset of Parkinson's disease to consider for DBS. Not only that, these why these things have come in? Because if we are going to intervene, if we are going to improve the quality of life for a patient, why to wait for people to become much more dependent? Choose early so that their quality of life can improve. This has been proven not by one or other studies, multiple studies which are looked into UPDRS2, that is basically which looks into non-motor symptoms, and UPDRS3, which looks into motor symptoms, there has been consistently good improvement in this set of patients over a period of time. What you can also notice 
the the scores at which patients are being taken up for the dbs initially it was around higher the scores now the number the score at which stn dbs is being considered is slowly dropping down to almost like early 30s this is what is going on so earlier the intervention better the outcomes to manage the quality of life the other important point has been how the levodopa response has been changing over a period of time what set of patient this is a nice graph given in that paper what you can notice is better the x axis indicates the average pre operative levodopa responsiveness and the y axis reveals the average percent of changes in a post operative dbs or the only in dbs on state there is almost like a linear improvement what you can see better the levodopa responsive better the yeah, dbs outcomes with a better outcome for the patient so right choice right time makes the best choice for the patients to improve the quality of life so what i can tell in regards to dbs dbs is a well accepted therapy for moderately advanced parkinson disease there is no question about that it has dramatic effects on various motor symptoms non motor symptoms uh, it is there uh, but yes we need to keep in uh, re remembrance of some of the red flags what we notice for the, for a, for management of dbs one thing as against to most of the other therapies dbs is one therapy where it genuinely reduces the dopaminergic medications and hence any dopaminergic medications related complications currently newer modalities such as closed loop would add for on for the symptom based treatment and better treatment outcomes for patients with parkinson disease i'll end my talk here but because i'll specifically sticking to the timeline what has given any questions i'll be happy, happy to take it thank you thanks a lot thanks prashant for finishing in time and as always uh, you delivered a very nice talk uh there are few questions it looks like and if there are any questions from the audience can come up or any questions from the panel if not then i go to the question from audience which have been there in the q and a section first question is what is your experience with oral epimorphine okay i think uh, oral epimorphine i'm not using it on a regular basis initially i tried for few of the patients Uh, the point is uh, it's a rescue therapy the amount of oral epimorphine required is higher as against the regular uh, uh, what you call it as injectable epimorphine what people will take it with this what happens is uh, when the people swallow the epimorphine along with that the nauseating sensation peripheral side effects are much more common also because the amount of dosage what is required higher and not only that the time duration for that to kick in in a rescue therapies is not the same because i think it's almost it took uh, when we did for few patients it was almost like around 40 to 45 minutes which is similar to of our levodopa patients what it came into it so i usually prefer injectable if you want to take it as a rescue therapy uh, as against something else so that is what in question to oral epimorphine what i'm looking into it then there is the next question are, is apomorphine yeah. better in levy body dementia yes uh, definitely i don't suggest it because currently what we are having uh, apomorphine currently we are using apomorphine only for parkinson disease uh, if levy body dementia is predominantly dominated by parkinsonism symptoms and if there are a lot of fluctuations are there a trial can be considered but i don't have a better answer because i don't have any of my patients who are on who either have levy body dementia or dementia associated with that to tell what are the outcomes in patients with levy body dementia if anyone else has a better experience can answer that okay uh, so next question is how do you escalate epimorphine so usually what happens uh, uh, there are two things what we do it one is apomorphin response test apomorphin response test when we do it we look into at what dosage patient will get good response so that apomorphin response test dosage is used for rescue therapies like let like it may be 2 mg 3 mg or 4 mg this is a dosage what people need to take it when they need to have quick onset of action for when the medications are not working but when it comes to continuous subcutaneous apomorphine infusion therapies 
uh, it is similar to DBS. It's not like we quickly escalate the dosages. We slowly build it up over a weekly basis, over four to six weeks normally, slowly on a weekly basis, you build it up. And in the meantime, you slowly reduce the levodopa dosages so that the GI related any side effects or peripheral side effects are minimized. Patients can tolerate it better uh, and have a better outcomes. What you should remember is most of the dropouts in upper morphine pump therapies always happen during the first one to two months. Either it is due to the discomfort of using the pumps or not tolerating the upper morphine pumps, uh, upper morphine infusions. So slower, steady increase helps to have better uh, adjustment to, to the pumps and better outcomes. And it also gives you time for patients to have better education. Right. So there are two questions on DBS. Are there any head-to-head -head trials of epomorphine and DBS? Currently, there are no head-to-head -head trials. Uh, yes. If I missed out, if any study is there, please let me know. I definitely, I remember, as far as I remember, there are no head-to-head -head trial between epomorphine versus DBS is there. Right. Most right. of the studies, what has happened is patients who were disqualified DBS, those are the patients who had gone into epomorphine. When you read the literature, most of the patients who went on to epomorphine therapies were those set of patients. And some of them, uh, usually either people go into apomorphine pump, the apomorphine therapy as a bridging therapy, many set of patients where for a certain months, let us say next two months, three months, I don't want to get operated. I want to get operated later on. Uh, so those set of patients also go for bridging therapies as a, it's not a head to head comparison going on. Right. What about sublingual apomorphine? Sublingual, I think this is coming up. I, have, I don't have any experience. Sublingual apomorphine is once again uh, for rescue therapy only. So either it is sublingual epomorphine or it is injectable epomorphine or intranasal leodopa. Uh, we need to see with the Indian experiences what is going to happen. If it is it is available, either the apotab or the sublingual epomorphine, if people can tolerate it, if it has a quick concept of action, definitely it will be useful as a rescue therapist, not as a continuous uh, a subcutaneous or continuous dopamine stimulation of therapy it may not work out like that. So any pen form available? Approved pen form. Pen is there, yes. Pen pen form formulations are available in India already. I think uh, uh, Celera Pharmaceuticals are marketing for the Ever Pharma and that pens are available in Indian market at this point of time. Right. Last question. Uh, what is the response on FOG of DBS? Uh, freezing of gate. I think more than me, Petra should be able to answer this question. He has a better experiences where most of the surgeries on FOGs happen. Uh, I do feel that uh, people have in gait issues and balance issues. DBS has a limitation. It's not so easy outcome. And many people, when they start developing gait issues, uh, it's like give and take either between bradykinesia, tremors versus the gait issues. And uh, usually it's a difficult curve if you want to ask me. Petrus, you want to add an answer to that? Yeah, so I think when you have to, when, when you're assessing a patient with freezing of gait, first confirm the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Be absolutely sure it's not PSPP and it's Parkinson's. Correct. Step two, if you're sure it's Parkinson's disease and not PSPP, um, if, try to figure out if the gait freezing improves with levodopa. If it's an off freezing and it completely improves with a supramaximal dose of levodopa, then yes, go ahead, do DBS, but be prepared to have a system that allows for all kinds of programming changes. So often you need to use low frequency, lowering the pulse width sometimes helps when you have gate freezing, especially if you're having issues with pyramidal side effects. But I would not deny a patient DBS on the basis of pre-op gate freezing, but I would warn them that gate freezing may not completely go away with DBS. But yes, I would make sure that I'm absolutely certain that the diagnosis of Parkinson's are not PSPP. Yeah, I think diagnosis is very important. And already if you have pre-operative, if you have gait issues, axial symptoms, make sure that you discuss with the patient about the outcomes. I also tell about like a defogging type of effect to people. Sometimes what you have that symptoms are developing, other symptoms become much better and your gait issues are left over. Sometimes you've noticed that those, those are the symptoms which are left over. So people have to be mentally be ready with those uh, acceptance that there may be sometimes uh, limitations which we can notice into it. Agree. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, you have uh, answered all the queries, looks like. Now uh, we proceed uh, into the next part and I request Dr. Ravi Adho to invite Dr. Pramit Palser. Uh, 
thank you uh, dr prashant and atul sir for uh, coordinating this uh, very important talk it is my proud privilege to uh, introduce uh, professor pramod kumar pal uh, who has uh, been at the helm of indian academy of neurology also and uh, he was a treasurer as well as past president of indian academy of neurology and he also spearheaded the formation of movement disorder society of india and was a uh, was founder secretary of movement disorder uh, society of india and he has a vast experience of uh, leadership as well as uh, several publications uh, in this field and he is currently at a senior position in mds and uh, chairing several research groups so without wasting much time i would uh, request uh, professor pal to deliver his talk on uh, uh, rare movement disorders what not to miss thank you ravi and thank you iin and mdsi so can i share my screen my screen visible yes sir it is yes. visible Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Ravi, again, again, IN and uh, MDSI. I am part of both. So in the next twenty-five minutes, uh, what I'll do is that I'll just quickly go through some of the disorders which we had missed and we should not have missed, as well as which you should not miss. And this, even the definition of rare movement disorder, is very controversial. A Parkinson's disease is also a treatable movement disorder, and it could be rare to most of the people uh, in India. so why we you know early diagnosis of a rare movement disorder is needed to start a specific treatment if it is available or at least prevent the progression or avoid the symptomatic or prevent uh, uh, prevent triggers of certain movement disorders okay prevent unnecessary investigation that is one of the major i think importance of knowing a diagnosis then prevent unnecessary treatment as i'll come to later on especially drug therapy and especially surgical therapy also like deep brain stimulation and of course giving genetic counseling to prevent further disorders in the family so not to miss a rmd is maybe due to you know diseases due to genetic causes where there are clinical clues which usually you can diagnose from the clinical clues or distinct phenotype or like non genetic causes like degenerative and acquired infections immuno mediated nowadays immuno mediated ones are quite treatable disorders as i'll come to later on and these are quite rare also and then of course the neurometabolic disorders so i'll just quickly go to uh, what are the distinct phenotypes which i'm going to discuss the first one i'll be discussing about dystonia and the later part i'll be discussing about the ataxias but to just tell you that most of the patients will not have only one phenotype they will have a mixture of uh, either dystonia chorea with myoclonus ataxia with parkinsonism etc so Just to come to the most common, probably the rarest movement disorder in the world, but the commonest movement disorder in India, from the silly smile to many faces of Wilson's disease. So you can see here, Wilson's disease earlier used to diagnose by caring and the silly smile, etc. But there could be various phenotypes of this Wilson's disease: severely dystonic phenotype, severely tremor type, which is more we are accustomed to. This is a patient with severe choreic type of phenotype, and you can see in this boy. With severe lingual abnormal movements, almost like stereotypy or whatever you can say is chorea or stereotypy. But our diagnostic things are yes, EF ring as well as you know MRI changes. But what I want to emphasize is that there are cases which we are increasingly coming across where the EF ring is absent clinically as well as with state lamp. And what do we do? We go on chasing the Uh, urinary copper, etc., etc. Then it doesn't go into. So recently, I came across a, across a patient who has psychiatric problems, who has some recent onset of abnormal movement, but KF ring is not there, state lamp is negative. Then we had a strong suspicion, and we told that. Uh, then we got a genetic. Somebody got a genetic testing. It showed uh, Wilson's disease abnormal. Uh, this thing, gen, uh, genetic defect is there. Mutation was there. Then we got a liver biopsy, and it showed increased copper in the. Uh, we got it from velor so this patient we started on uh, treatment for wilson's disease so you do not always depend on kf ring in a same family i have found one patient with kf ring with symptoms one patient without a kf ring with symptoms so we have to move beyond the our clinical acumen as well as the state lab of kf ring 
Wilson's disease, even Nero Wilson's, may be there without K3. Now the next, let us come to not to miss the DOPA responsive dystonias. You can, you know that it can be due to GCH1 mutation or TH mutation, or there are some other mutations also there, like terrain, etc. So these are the two cases which you know uh, I really remember about. This is a patient where it is a, all are unusual cases. In a case of late onset DOPA responsive dystonia, isolated dystonia secondary novel tyrosine hydroxylase. So this patient used to walk like this almost till the age of 18 years, okay? And then just we started on levodopa and forget about the genetic testing, even without the genetic testing, we knew that it is a levodopa responsive dystonia. So this is very important that any patient of dystonia, you should give a trial of levodopa. Then this is another patient recently, uh, our group has uh, is uh, about to report. This is a patient where there's a tyrosine hydroxylase deficiency, but you can see here, lot of jerks rather than a dystonia plus jerks. And this, you can see after treatment, uh, significant improvement in the uh, symptom profile. So again, dystonia with or without Parkinsonism, with or without myoclonus, you should always have a strong suspicion and at least give this uh, enough first treatment of levodopa. This is another patient, it is under publication now. This is a patient who came with jerky movements of the proximal upper limb. And actually, a patient was thought this is actually psychiatric. There's a lot of suicidal ideations, etc. Et then we found that there is a certain is not going through and probably that is a micro -instrument. But we were surprised with genetic testing. And before that, only we gave levodopa, and there was a significant improvement. Genetic testing, what it showed, it shows a GCH, again, a mutation. It is one of the under uh, DRD, but the phenotype is different from the classical, which has been reported. Okay. But it, clinically, we thought that it could be the many people thought it could be like a function because a lot of variation. But as soon as there's a response to Levotopa, we realized that we are dealing with a rare variant of this uh, genetic disorder. Now, so why I'm showing this? Because the parietal stimulation now it has been uh, so the next group of disorders which I'm going to come is the TOR one or dystonia one. This we thought that in India it is quite rare, but it is not so. Over the last few years, we are increasingly recognizing these disorders, and it is very important to recognize any patient who has a lower limb dystonia to start with. And the really the GPI DBS is very satisfactory in these uh, patients. So it is very important to recognize these disorders so that we do not try to prevent the uh, contractures of this patient. This patient already had a contracture. This patient was primarily you know, dealt with by uh, Dr. Ravi. But you can see here the significant improvement, though the contracture obviously will not increase. But it is very important that we do genetic testing in these patients. These patients obviously did not respond to Levodopa. Just recently, Ravi is another patient. This child came with this type of dystonia, did one positive. And there was a very significant improvement. We, I think we were able to get some low cost, uh, some subsidized deep brain stimulation. And you can see this pre-DBS stimulation and after the DBS. Within just one week, actually, there was some improvement. And this is after about three months, significant improvement. So we should never miss these DRDs and the DIT ones in India. Now, these are some of the cases, which are, this is DIT 11. This is, I um, just covered the face because of the obvious reasons. Uh, but these are also, we are increasingly recognizing now, dystonia with myoclonus and tremulousness. And I, there are certain review articles are there where it has been shown that these patients can have a significant improvement after deep brain stimulation. So any patient with tremor with some jerky component, some dystonic component, just go ahead. And obviously, in most of the patients, we do not get a response to alcohol because either they have not taken or they do not want to. And especially in the ladies, most of our patients, actually what we found were in ladies with DIT11. So it is important to recognize. Now the saga of the KMT2B which actually every day is teaching a lesson to us. It is definitely a good, uh, there's a good therapeutic response to deep brain stimulation. So they are the two patients. The lower panel patient I was seeing for almost 15 years and I got a diagnosis about three months back. And this is a patient also, I think I was looking after for about 10 to 10 years. So you can see, uh, we always recognize about the phenotypic, the bulbous nose, elongated face. They're from different families. but you can see when they start walking, you will see how much is the similarity. And we sure that these were the patients which were 
earlier diagnosing as dystonic cerebral palsy, turning terrors, perinatal insert, hypoxic brain injury, etc. This patient so many times had come to us, but ultimately we did a genetic testing, free genetic testing, and just a week or I think one month back we found that this is okay. Not still we are trying to see that whether he can be given a different situation uh, from humanitarian agencies. So this is phenomenology you should try to recognize. Even if you do not get a recognition, I mean, you cannot recognize, you go ahead with the genetic testing as much as possible. Then the ADCY directed discarnishes. Again, now this is also nowadays responsive to, you know, deep brain stimulation and also responsive to coffee and caffeine. So I'm not going to the details, but usually onset in the first decade. This is a case which is uh, from this publication. Usually it starts, the, there are, the, you know, it was earlier, it used to be called the fish, uh, the movements could be paroxysmal, triggered from, uh, from the transitions of sleep, previously called familial discarnation with facial myotemia. We saw two patients, uh, I think with the third patient in the last uh, few years. This is a patient who came with us, the first patient which we diagnosed with ADCY5. Recently, the patient mother came to us and she's a very good response to every day. The child takes coffee in the morning and there's significant improvement. They also have a lot of you know, sleep-related paroxysmal disturbances. This is another patient which uh, we recently found uh, having this abnormality, but this one to highlight is the facial abnormalities, facial dyskinesias, facial myopia, etc. In this, you go ahead with the genetic testing for ADCY5. Now, again, this. You should not miss these rare disorders of hypermanganesemia, bilateral hyperintense T1 weighted images, you know, globus pallidus. And nowadays, you know, you can see Devani's uh, or publications, and our there are a lot of publications now from India with SLC 39A14 mutations. And these patients can be given some chelation therapy uh, if those are uh, critically mediated. Then the paroxysmal dyskinesias, everyone, we should not miss because these can be treatable with antiepileptic drug. These are not functional disorders. And sometimes we see paroxysmal disorders and really underlying disorder could be hypocalcemia, as in this patient, a patient of group one deficiency. Again, it is very commonly. Now I realize that 20 years back, I was treating a patient with episodic choric for movement and seizures. And just a, two, three months back, I got the report when we could analyze this group one deficiency. So these have a strong index of suspicion in those who have episodic disorder. In the coriform disorders, again, it is common. Don't miss the rheumatic chorea in India, treatable. So you should always look in a young onset chorea with cardiac uh, examination, look for uh, uh, features of rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic activity. Why I'm showing this slide? There are neuroacrobosis, every movement disorder species can diagnose with, uh, you know, feeding dystonias. And, but often we subject these patients to different, different types of treatments, a peripheral blood smear acanthocytes is easily missed. So you should have a strong clinical suspicion, oromandibular dystonia, feeding dystonia, lower part of the face dystonia, autosomal recessive, psychiatric problems, seizures, peripheral neuropathy. These has a lot of clinical implications, uh, genetic implications, as well as, you know, you need to counsel the families because we have seen so many families having divorced because these patients get the illness symptom around the age of 25, 30 and they ultimately file divorce petitions, et cetera. So it is better to uh, you know, identify these diseases and these are not Huntington disease. And our age old uh, classical movement disorders, why I'm showing it? Because commonly still we see SSP, you can see the slow um, myoclonus and in these patients. And also we should not miss CJD in the neuroinfection profile. And because this may not be able to treat but you should not do unnecessary investigations. A EEG as well as a clinical recognition is uh, you know, well enough to clinch a diagnosis. Now, just about the auto uh, antibodies, uh, anti-neural antibodies and the immune mediated antibody related disorders. NMD antiphylitis is very common. You should have a clinical suspicion and it is treatable. This is a patient with uh, LGI-1 encephalitis, classical brachial seizures. You should again look for underlying uh, causes, and especially in children, you should look for other causes of uh, malignancies. Person syndrome, immunomodulation can be given. Morbid syndrome, a clinical suspicion, and just the EMG needle and clinch the diagnosis. And in these patients, obviously, anti-GAD antibodies, etc. First, I was about to prepare this lecture. You can see here 
Dr. Vikram sent me the, this follow up of this patient just seen about seven days back, and two days back. And uh, I got this report strongly positive Eglon 5. Okay. This patient actually presented with abnormal tongue movements, but we saw there's some facial uh, Parkinsonian features are there. We asked, we saw the sleep disturbances, doubtful, and uh, just if, uh, about a few months' history. Based on a the, this time, whoever has added attend to the Madrid conference, there was a case in the video rounds, I think, the similar nature with Iglon positive. We just sent this investigation, MRI was no, normal. Just about an hour back, we got this strongly positive for Iglon 5. So let us see. So in Iglon 5, I was reviewing this literature, bulbous symptoms has been described, but not so classical uh, abnormal tongue movements, but usually there is present progress to other sleep disturbances, PSP like phenotype and uh, other disturbances. Okay. So you should now, I am going to just, uh, next, I think I only have 10, 15 minutes. So I'll just discuss with uh, treatable ataxias. So there are almost all uh, ataxias are rare in India. And uh, you should try to you know, identify these disorders, whichever has some at least uh, treatable aspect. Starting from ataxia with vitamin E deficiency, A beta lipoproteinuria, CTX, Neiman Vick disease, et cetera. So let us go through some of the things. So how the mechanism-based treatment available for treatable ataxia is like reduction of the toxic target molecules like in CTX, dietary interventions like in gluten-induced ataxias or in vitamin E deficiencies, like in supplements for vit with vitamins, management of specific triggers, like in ADC, you have seen just now the GLUT uh, deficiency, GLUT1 deficiency, they can also have specific ataxias, et cetera. So these are patients where this is this is the patient still I have you know I have seen ten years back and now he is again admitted in our hospital with different problems but you can you should not miss this tendon xanthoma and this time if anyone has seen in the annals of movement disorder the journal the first page shows a large number of photos with uh, uh, CTX and tendon xanthoma so you should look for the tendon xanthomas and also obviously for the abnormalities in the MRI in the you know the cerebellum dentate etc. Treatment definitely is there if you uh, do it early. Oral keratinoplasty can be given. So this patient present mainly with ataxia. This patient is now very dysarthric, ataxic, spastic. This is a patient where Neiman Pick disease with uh, upward gaze palsy. If they have dystonic manifestations or ataxic manifestations, changing the diagnosis is the POMI cells in the bone marrow, apart from the genetic testings. But there is a treatment which may not be available in India and it may be very costly. But no doubt, there is a, this is a cause of a, this is a treatable ataxia, if possible. Neglustat. Then we come to this is a patient with uh, root one. Again, another patient just to show that they can also present with ataxia. And if treated early, these patients can have uh, reversible uh, brain damage uh, and can be reversed and also. Prevention of the attacks can be done. This recently worked up mainly by Dr. Vikram. Uh, this is a patient with uh, abital hyperproteinemia. What clinched the diagnosis was this patient had a large volume fatty diarrheas in, from infancy and dysarthria, night blindness, classical retinitis pigmentosa, acanthocytes. So this, apart from the, you know, before the genetic testing, only we met the diagnosis of uh, this uh, abital hyperproteinemia causing ataxia. And this patient, May be helped, but we do not know after dietary modification, which is still quite costly. Uh, I'll just play the video, maybe another five to minutes. Yeah. So this is the patient you can see with ophthalmoplegia also this patient had. This is a little rare in cases of uh, abida lipoprotein with ataxia. So the other, other you know, uh, treatable causes like Refsum's disease, then uh, Avid, I already told you, episodic ataxias, Coenzyme Q10 deficiency. This time, if anyone attends the movement disorder video round cases uh, on 26th, of, I think on 16th October, and Dr. Divya will be presenting one case of coenzyme Q10 deficiency causing ataxia, then biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglia disease, biotin deficiency. This needs a clinical suspicion, and any case of ataxia, you should do the neurometabolic screening. So, this is a patient again with ataxia, spastic paresis, and dystonia. And you can see that uh, in this patient, we diagnosed as a biotin deficiency. We had started on biotin, but I don't know how much will be the benefit. You should be 
treated early in the disease. Then these are the other causes of rare, very rare causes. Uh, I have yet to see cerebral protein deficiency, etc., causing ataxia. Wilson's disease, I have already told you, Frederick's ataxia. There is no treatment as of now, but there are a lot of you know, clinical trials going on with histone D, acetylase inhibitors, etc., and it is worth having a cohort of Frederick's ataxia. Soon a treatment may be available. This is a patient with gluten ataxia. In India, we do not see very often. This is borrowed from this uh, publication, uh, courtesy of this publication. Insidious onset sporadic onset of cerebral ataxia, case of nystagmus, postural tremor, and in 10% of the cases, you can get a GI symptoms. But you can get an anti gliadin antibodies, you know, and this clinches the diagnosis. And if you give gluten free diet, the patients will improve if given in the early stages. So, anti gliadin antibody already I have uh, told you, and just to uh, uh, you know, give an overview of the paraneoplastic cerebral degeneration, which is definitely treatable to some extent as you try to remove the cause of you know the neoplasia as well as give immunomodulation therapy. So isolated cerebellar syndrome can be because of breast and ovarian cancer causing anti U antibody, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then you can have uh, anti U antibody in small cell carcinoma of the lung. Obstetrics myoclonus ataxia syndrome is very common in patients with ovarian and breast cancer and proximal muscle weakness. This again is common in the uh, CLR. So this is a patient which uh, you know had CA breast, had uh, antibodies, uh, paraneoplastic anti-U antibody. So uh, you can see the nystagmus here and uh, clinical examination and history obviously clinches this diagnosis. This is another patient where the uh, you can see here a bit nystagmus in this patient. Sorry, let's see if it plays or not. So this is a patient with past history of CA breast, attacks are nine months, slowness of activities, reduced interaction, forgetfulness, and she had a, a high titer of anti guide antibody. She had, uh, you can see here, vertical nystagmus. So these are uh, treatable uh, causes of ataxia. Again, in children with uh, obstetrics myoclonus ataxia syndrome, you should recognize this disorder. Just don't pass it off as an autoimmune because in children, you have to rule out presence of neuroplasticity. And give appropriate treatment. So this is another patient with anti-Casper antibody we found, where uh, this patient uh, had presented with ataxia and some uh, chorea and abnormal eye movements. So in this patient also there was significant improvement after giving five cycles of uh, low volume plasmapheresis. So just to conclude that you know uh, rare movement disorders. You should, uh, all movement disorders, you should try to find a treatable cause, not only rare movement disorders. Rare depends on how often you see a disease and age, age at onset, family history, temporal profile, aggravating and relieving factors, systemic features, other neurological signs, combined movement disorder or isolated movement disorders. All these will help you to make a clinical diagnosis of a disease, syndrome, or a phenomena. Do the appropriate investigations. If you have a specific diagnosis, it could be treatable movement disorder or a rare movement disorder. And if you do not get non-specific diagnosis, then you may have to just give a symptomatic treatment, genetic counseling, and just refer to some support groups. So I thank you for your attention and I acknowledge my whole team uh, of the Nimans Parkinson's disease and movement disorder subspeciality. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, such a wonderful talk. And I think the message is very clear that uh, the two cases I think which you highlighted like KMT2B which was being followed up for so many years and now with the current knowledge of genetics we are we are able to look relook at these cases and also the case of GLUT1 so uh, they have been all labeled as uh, cerebral palsy dystonic so I think with the current uh, knowledge we should try to relook at these cases and uh, so uh, any I'll just look at some of the questions which have been asked Dr. Divyani has asked, so, sir, what did the patient's MRI show who had no KF ring and negative slit lamp and whose liver biopsy was diagnostic? Normal MRI. Normal MRI. Normal. Oh. Yeah. So, this patient, you know, uh, I think uh, victim is following up. Uh, this patient's relative is also a doctor and they were very, because there's a borderline cerebroplasmic abnormality was there. But always the KF ring was negative slit lamp, etc. And so we went ahead with the liver biopsy. Liver biopsy, we had 
very good you know follow up of two three patients when k thing is negative you go ahead with the liver biopsy and it is mainly done in chennai and uh, the lab i don't know which one it was and done in cmc belur dr pal Uh, yeah. w- w- uh, what is your experience regarding this uh, the serum cellulopasmin level in these patients? All have a normal cellulopasmin, or cellulopasmin is always low? Normal, uh, normal or just low normal. But this urinary copper business, I do not know. Is it is to be very erratic? Some is to be high, high copper and all. So uh, I do not. Unless we do it in MS, we do not go for the other labs. But I do not depend on this cellulopasmin and serum copper. Uh, it. you know in the same patient same family i tell you two kids we one with a kfring positive having symptoms one with a kfring negative having symptoms and when we did the genetic testing i don't know vikram is there or not it gave something it gave i think uh, it is normal or something like that so we did not look for all the genes of wilson so when you ask for exome sequencing i don't have much knowledge but there are many many you know mutations are there and probably the exome sequencing may not help to get a diagnosis of wilson's disease Yeah. So you have to go for whole genome sequencing. I didn't really do not know, but I was stunned to see that these two kids, the affected kid, did not have uh, that particular genetic. I think uh, Prashant is there. Yeah, yes, he is the I master. I think when it comes to whole exome sequencing, because when you look into Wilson disease genetics, there are so many hot spots and so many mm-hmm. mutations are there. Uh, it's uh, the known mutations can be picked up. if the new uh, unknown mutations are there the genetic testing will not pick up yeah. so uh, genetic testing will help in family screening where the mutation is known uh, yeah. if the mutation is negative uh, it does not completely rule out like similar to all other genetic testing so we need to understand that there is an a, a pinch of salt one when you are going to analyze these genes and uh, the way the answers are interpreted so clinical diagnosis is the most important thing when it comes down to analysis of these patients especially so the patient who has a kfring the genetic analysis was negative yes the brother kfring was not there huh. and he has mild symptoms mri is normal in one one is abnormal in another no i th- so genetic testing based upon what genes and what hot spots yeah. there are there so many hot spots which are not getting yeah. picked up I think already 700 plus or 800 plus mutations have been reported. I don't know how many they are able to pick up at this point. I mean, yeah, we, we have asked the all Indian to have a re. We have asked Medjino to have a relook at this whole okay. thing. Because a lot Sorry. of Indian data is there where not everyone we have a genetic positive patient. So so many mutations are there. And even if you look into North India, South India, West India, the hotspots are different when you look into these patients. Very interesting. Yeah. There are another two uh, questions. Uh, is kinodeoxycholic acid available in india <laughs> and uh, no, dr kinodeoxycholic acid, acid is available kinodeoxycholic acid some have procured from outside yeah. but this, yeah. this patient was getting only acidic folic acid i think yeah. uh, another question is sir new neonatal infantile onset chorea is resource limited setting how should we approach with minimal investigations infant onset i think chorea. neonatal and infant onset i think we should go for a metabolic screening is the first Uh, approach should be the metabolic neurometabolic screening and uh, the pediatricians may be the best uh, those uh, because chorea and all those at this at that age is obviously more most often due to uh, metabolic causes metabolic causes so, so two last questions sir one is the dr dasari has asked sir drugs for dvt 28 other than dopa i think he and lulu has asked sir should try we give her dopa trial to all adult onset dystonia patients i think see one thing is that there is no harm in giving a uh, trial if the patient has not been tried there are even some sporadic uh, you know adult onset the cervical dystonia that was responded to dopa okay dopa trial i do not give dopa trial one tablet four times a day in the first day you can just tell the take the patient to consider uh, you know confidence that for a month i am going to give you a lubodopa trial gradually increasing it to see for 2 3 months if that is negative then i am sure for the whole life that i am not going to give any more lubodopa trial i am going to start with the anti lubodopa or the neuroleptics anticholinergic etc so my dictum is that we always give a trial of lubodopa in whatever dystonia and it sometimes helps actually and it is not that you know only the dopa dystonia get benefited by lubodopa sometimes 
we need a mixed bag of treatment of Ligotopa because you remember that if you start on neuroleptics like and the patient will later on develop Parkinsonism also. In that case also, you'll be forced to do, uh, give Ligotopa. So it will be a hot first bag of Ligotopa and neuroleptics, anticholinergics, baclofen in the severe cases. Thank you, uh, sir, for providing insights into rare movement disorders. Uh, now uh, I invite uh, Dr. Wali to introduce the next uh, speaker, Dr. Pankaj. Dr. Wali. So we'll have three short case presentation, 10 minutes each, maximum 10 minutes each. Uh, the first case presentation is by Dr. Pankas Agrawal. He's a neurologist and a movement disorder specialist at the Global Hospital Bombay. I request Pankas. Hello, <clears throat> can you see my screen, please? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Wali, and thank you, uh, Ravi, and uh, thank you to Dr. Surya and the IAN and the MDSI for asking me to show this case. So uh, this was an interesting boy that we saw uh, a few years ago. Uh, so we have titled this, The Boy with a Twist in His Knickers. So this was an eight-year-old schoolboy from uh, the interior of Maharashtra and he had difficulty walking for one year duration. His leg would sometimes twist of its, on its own. Sometimes the hand also could become bent on the same side. And this was often when he used to walk back from school. It used to last for several hours and these episodes were uh, two to three a month. So you can see the video. So this is a home video by the family during one of the attacks and they showed a right-sided dystonic posturing and uh, these attacks could be on one side and sometimes on the other side and sometimes they could be even bilateral. Could often be quite disabling and sometimes they used to fall even, as you can see. And these are discrete attacks during which uh, he would have this posturing and uh, in between the attacks he would be normal. So they were clearly, this is another attack. And this time it's on the left side. Mainly dystonia of the foot and also of the hand. And sometimes they could be bilateral as well. And so you can see an attack here where it is bilateral foot dystonia, mainly of the foot, but also of the hand. Okay, uh, so his uh, birth and development was normal. His school performance was average. He was cognitively quite normal and he was asymptomatic till about a year ago when these attacks began. And there was no other uh, positive medical history. And uh, one younger brother was normal at this time. So all these other tests uh, were normal and uh, cerebroplasmin, there was no Wilson's, etc. His MRI brain, uh, I will come to in a minute. <clears throat> Just to summarize, this was an eight-year-old boy with intermittent dystonia, uh, paroxysmal, and uh, was not provoked by sudden movement or by exercise. So it was paroxysmal, non-kinesogenic, dyskinesis. This was the picture. So we know the differences. I won't go into the details of these, uh, but PNKD is different from PKD in that the attacks are longer and uh, less frequent. And sometimes uh, there are secondary causes, but we should remember the primary causes of paroxysmal dyskinesia. So in this boy, we suspected one of these primary genes, and especially because his phenotype was PNKD, we suspected that he would have an MR1 gene mutation. But his MRI was uh, you know, found to be abnormal. And here you can see that there are bilateral uh, pallidal hyperintensities, which are not expected in a case of primary genetic uh, MR1 uh, mutation PNKD. And so therefore this was not explained. And because of this, we did tests for other secondary causes of PNKD, mainly metabolic. So uh, a number of tests to rule out other conditions that, such as methyl malonic aciduria and the uh, other organic acidurias, but they were negative as well. 
And this is uh, just a short uh, sort of uh, list of disorders we ruled out be because of these pallidal hyperintensities, which were not fitting in with primary genetic dystonia. But he had none of these because he tested for all of them. So interestingly, after a few years, four years later, his younger brother, who was initially normal, also became abnormal. And he started developing very similar attacks of PNKD, exactly similar. And so this is when it, uh, uh, we realized he had a likely genetic disorder. And uh, we tested for PNKD gene, but it was negative. And also we tested for the other two genes. As you know, PRRT2 and SLC2A1 cause uh, PKD and uh, GLUT1 or PED, respectively, kinesogenic and exercise. These were also negative. So around that time, we saw this article in Movement Disorders, which uh, brought attention to ECHS1 or X1 mitochondrial gene mutation. And this caused a paroxysmal dystonia with pallidal lesions. So we were convinced at the time when we read this, that this boy had this same gene, but this also turned out to be negative. This is just a video of the, uh, yeah, this was a four band. But this is the younger brother, and again, home video, because these attacks are paroxysmal, and when he comes to the clinic, the boy is normal. So again, this boy, the brother had identical attacks, and hemidystonia. So now we have two kids with PNKD, and one has pallidal lesions. So all these genes, as I told you earlier, are negative. So again, we are stuck. And at this point, um, long story short, we proceeded to whole exome sequencing, and that showed a mutation in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, uh, which is a mitochondrial gene. Um, and um, this was the cause of the, of, the, of the abnormality in these two children. And uh, so PDH is a large complex consisting of several subunits. And in this boy, the subunit involved was PDHB because that gene was mutated. And uh, the literature shows that a number of these uh, children, around 80 or 90, have been described with various subunit mutations. Often they will present with a number of features as are listed over here. And there are few very variable ranging from even death to very mild isolated phenotypes. Often these can be paroxysmal. So paroxysmal ataxia, paroxysmal dystonia have been described with some of the other subunits. And interestingly, uh, some of these cases have also been shown to have hyperintensity in the basal ganglia. There are a few cases, but they have been described. So in our case, the final diagnosis was PDHB mutation causing familial, isolated, paroxysmal, non-kinesogenic dystonia, dyskinesia, with pallidal hyperintensity. So this is a very interesting review paper by Bharti et al. And here the summary if one could see was that in PNKD, if there are these pallidal lesions, there are only two genes. One is X1, if the onset is less than 18, and the other is PDH, as in this case, if the onset is less than two years. Here the onset was around seven years, but some variations can occur. So it's interesting that this was mentioned in this article by Dr. Bhatia, a very well-known article um, in 2018. So this boy responded very, very well to carbamazepine initially and his attack subsided very dramatically and even the younger sibling we gave carbamazepine and he also responded which is unusual for pk for pnkd and then we after knowing this pdh mutation we added this mitochondrial cocktail and uh, and and these two boys actually improved quite a lot with uh, after uh, this mitochondrial cocktail and there are some papers suggesting that uh, there, is, there may be some improvement in, in children who have these mitochondrial mutations. And this we succeeded in publishing in Movement Disorders. And uh, here you can see that there are these uh, pallidal hyperintensities uh, in one of uh, these two boys. So to take home, in a case of paroxysmal movement disorder, so one has to, of course, rule out a secondary cause of paroxysmal dystonia or dyskinesia. And if it is primary or genetic, we must always ask that if the dy dystonia, dyskinesia, paroxysmal is provoked by, that is the primary question we always ask, if it is provoked by movement or exercise. So therefore, we can classify as PKD or paroxysmal exercise induced. But of course, if these two are not there, then it is paroxysmal non-kinesogenic. And the few genes that I have already mentioned, 
they must always be kept in mind and we heard in the previous talk also by dr pal that uh, there are some other, other genes adcy5 even atp1 a3 and uh, uh, glut1 these can all also cause paroxysmal uh, dystonia but if there are palatal hyperintensities then you must not forget these two genes x1 and pdc pyruvate dehydrogenase one more thing is uh, practically speaking always try carbamazepine it is supposed to help in pkd but in this boy there are some papers that it can help even if it is pnkd and based on that we tried it in this boy and he had a very dramatic effect and he continues to have that after 3 4 years so the family is very happy and always use thiamine or mitochondrial cocktail especially if a mitochondrial disorder is even possible because there are papers of some children who are completely responded if they have a mitochondrial mutation <clears throat> thank you really a rare uh, but a good uh, teaching uh, case i should say pankaj agrawal we must congratulate you for going to the depth and finding out what is the cause of this case and it has become almost treatable in this family great thing thank you so much and it uh, i think vinakshi had commented on this and i congratulate him also on commenting commenting correctly thank you dr agrawal what mitochondrial cocktail you used i mean you used some single preparation or you used this in in different uh, uh, preparations sorry sir uh, uh, for mitochondrial cocktail did you use a single preparation uh, or a, you added uh, several uh, preparations no so we asked our pediatrician and uh, they are more familiar with this mitochondrial cocktail mm -hmm. and they gave a number of uh, uh, there are some commercially available ones um, so they are more familiar with this but uh, we use those uh, in in these boys <clears throat> Thank you. We can go for the next case. Thank you, sir. Is uh, I think it's by Dr. Soham Desai, who is a web writer of the MDSI. He represented the case now. Thank you, Dr. Wali, and also a big thank you to Dr. Nirmal Surya and Dr. UMS and all the guys at the IN who thought of this novel thing of integrating IN and MDSI and all other subfield also and have awareness sessions. Am I audible? And uh, my slides are visible to all. Yes. 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 Sir. yes, sir. Right. So, right from uh, the two hundred years from when uh, James Parkinson described the the Parkinson disease, what we call now, in his essay on the shaking palsy, to having its own mascot or this tulip flower to raise advocacy, two hundred years have passed. And when Dr. Rishi told me that you have to present the case, he told me before you, Dr. Petras will present everything on. Uh, management of pd dr prashant will talk of advanced uh, techniques for managing it and then he said dr pal will take up all rare disorders and then he said pankaj will present one exotic case very rare case and interesting case so i thought what do i do now i think most of the things are already covered here so what do i do so i thought let me some, take up something which is still in the blind spot in when we manage patient with parkinson disease so uh, as we all know james parkinson uh, described this essay six patients he described everything and it was actually recognized by sharcot and he said that james parkinson's work is authentic and is correct and so he said that this disease is such that we should call it parkinson disease and he described that it can present without tremor too for years it was thought that pd is only dopamine deficiency in substantial agra so there are a lot of things in the iceberg like we were not able to see The same thing happened when Dr. Rai Choudhury and all started to talk about lot of non-motor symptoms, and then we all realized that 
there are a lot of non motor issues also which are there in patient with pd and subsequently people have read shaking palsy book again and they say that in his six patient he has described all the even the non motor symptoms also he has described at length so then that brought to me to think did he miss anything in the essay so i thought that there is something in the blind spot which is not yet much covered by all and uh, i'll i brought in the reference to charcot also so i'll see why i brought in here so i'll talk about a case this is not a very exotic case uh, this is a female who is 56 year old who has the classic parkinson disease started with uh, tremors rest tremors rigidity akinesia and postural symptoms for 3 years only in the right upper limb upper limb she had a very good response to levodopa carbidopa clinically she is hny2 and has normal gait and balance now she this this such patients often come to our opd they say her complaint is that sometimes i am losing the effect of the drug intermittently so i asked her for how long she says intermittently for some time she has 15 to 20 minutes of such time where she has severe tremors sometimes she can control it sometimes she cannot control it and then she is there after 20 30 minutes it improves on its own and she says these are very severe moments everybody starts looking at her and she feels very embarrassed about it she says this doesn't happen every day it happens only sometimes and the last it happened a week uh, ago in the afternoon so now how do we approach this at present if we look she says i'm absolutely fine examination is absolutely fine so what are the things we can think of so this is when we start thinking about treatment fluctuation but this is like only 3 years into illness so it may, it may not actually happen so one thing could be that there is wearing off because the drug is inadequate or is it beginning of dyskinesia we don't they are saying that there is a high, hyperkinetic movement so then is it peak dose end of dose we don't know is he missing a drug is he taking a drug twice by mistake or i think those things were rule out but what is odd point odd point is that this is not happening every day and this happens only for 10 to 15 minutes so then we have to ask what are the situation which which have leads to this so one way could be that we tell the patient that you go and bring a video and i'll see later but that often may not help because the patient often comes to us from very far off and they may not come again after 2 3 months so what do we do so sometimes we can do a videography and see what happens as you can see there was mild rest tremor otherwise yeah. bradykinesia is reasonably well controlled on medicines mota bhage to sara sadresh ramana i'll translate in the gujarati thing she says everything yeah. most of it is all right so then, what i did is suggestion that it will happen now just just let us focus on the movement tha 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 She could control a bit. डिस्ट्रेक्शन टेक्निक्स दैट वी कैन टीच दम so that they can be controlled so not very big genetic thing or rare thing but something which uh, if we not we are not looking into it we may keep on increasing levodopa drugs and actually that can cause problems so the the building block for diagnosing functional disorder is we should have two things incongruence and inconsistency which i i demonstrated in in the video here 
now, now why i brought this point is actually sharkot is a well known person who used to talk about functional disorders at that time he used to name it hysteria and like he did a lot of work on it james parkinson saw his patient for 10 uh, years and did everything but somehow both of them they missed out on the presence of functional disorders and i think this was still not known by all till 2010 2012 and more after 2018 and 20 when a good uh, multi center study was done so why did this happen because lot of times so fnds and somatoform disorders are also very common in patient with pd but this overlap or overlay was denied for years there were reports off and on in the past but they were not given in highlight they were not highlighted the main reason was that even the md field itself the expertise was actually evolving over the years the other problem was that the earlier the term with that was used was hysteria and that was associated with lot of social discomfort and then we know that we have heard both the positive and negative sides for years dystonia and camptochromia were thought to be psychogenic but now we know they are organic and similarly for years proprospinal myoclonus and essential pallidal tremor were thought to be organic but now we know that they are functional some similar things have been described in the spanish flu pandemic post encephalic parkinsonism lot of patients along with parkinsonism they also had personality disorders there are cases where or videos where they had bizarre postures not explained by parkinsonism and then uh, episodes where they just had knee buckling and they would fall uh, this was to such extent that in some uh, literature they were, it was thought as maladie experimental and that people believe that the duodopa and all they are trying it is still experimental but subsequently we all know that in the epilepsy world pnes and epilepsy can both coexist and then subsequently when dbs was started in pd people have reported that fnd can happen in pd patients even after dbs so subsequently uh, this has come into focus but still it is not very well known to lot of practicing neurologists though now people with movement is expert are realizing that fnd is can happen in patient with pd so important thing is eyes will know only know what mind knows so how do we know that from science or history when we can diagnose that the patient with pd may also have fmd as a comorbidity so if there is something which happens acutely without any trigger like fever or infection or head injury or drug then starting or fluctuating course and something which spontaneously remits and spontaneously relapses and then paravisual movements that are not congruent topographically with the baseline pd or its sequel or its like medication schedule like i showed in this patient and then symptoms can improve or by distraction and with suggestion they can actually be precipitated so these are the things which are important to look into when we are examining a patient with pd now people have even given uh, models of uh, how to uh, diagnose fnd or how they occur so they are biological psychological and social models all different types of fnds have been described in patient with parkinson disease these are two very good uh, review articles and this study multi center study which i would like all to read about it and there is a very good review article uh, editorial by dr mark hallett that patients with pd are often prone to develop functional disorders and this is something which still is uh, in the blind spot of we as clinicians and neurologists uh, and now people have also starting to give up a physiological and biochemical theory of how fnds can happen in pd and this is like a, a area of interest and the the since i started to look into this i have found more and more cases of such uh, coexisting functional movement disorders in a in patients with pd so again this is again a pd patient who who has episodes where he has such neck movements and as you can see these are not happening consistently there is lot of incongruency this actually cannot be explained uh, by leodopa this are not temporary related to leodopa and they can be distractible and uh, uh, to to make things short when the patient's attention is diverted when we start talking to him the things change and we divert the attention and start talking to him about his dozing schedules and all while he is not doing that video is being recorded this can like be controlled very nicely so it is important uh, to treat fnd is also when they occur as a comorbidity in uh, patient with pd important things are simple communication strategies are important 
these patients need a lot of time in your OPD to diagnose them uh, why positive symptoms. Uh, they can be helped by uh, self-information, self-help leaflets, and low-cost interventions can actually improve their quality of life very nicely. This is a short mnemonic to how to treat or how to heal FMDs. So you can say therapist, which is explain them what is the terminology of FMD properly, hear them out properly, explain them the symptoms, reassure them, address their main concerns and anxieties that they have, explain that these are very good prognosis, individualize their treatment according to what type of FMDs they have, provide them self-help literature, and treat comorbidity like whatever anxiety or adjustment disorder or mood disorder that they have. I'll end here. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Swam. It was a very nice uh, practice-oriented uh, presentation. In fact, fantastic. Uh, we also observe that uh, people who don't have Parkinson, sometimes they come and say that they have got Parkinson. Uh, yeah. Sometimes yes. I have a small book of uh, Parkinson's disease in local languages. And say, sir, exactly what you told me, that's what I have Parkinson. Hai. Exactly. And I say, I say that, why, why you call it? He says, I walk slowly. And that guy has got osteoarthritis. So that is how a lot of awareness about Parkinson is there in the wrong way in the lay public, especially when they're related to their uh, Parkinson patients and also neighbors are like that and so on and so forth. Yes, I even essential tremors and historic tremor patients also do often feel that they have Parkinson in them. So, uh, yeah, they are all, and, and on the also, patients yeah. with PSP or CBGD, they undergo sp spine surgeries and uh, knee osteoarthritis surgeries and knee replacement. So, there are uh, we are all as physicians erring both on the both the ways, misdiagnosing as well as underdiagnosing uh, and overdiagnosing. So that I is think you I'm post saying. DBS also what you highlighted is. Yes. One area which uh, not uh, commonly, but we have seen a yeah, so couple of patients with uh, once you know there is becomes something burden yeah. on normality. So yes. when they have these problems, they they have face that VIP status, and sometimes when uh, patients undergo DBS and they improve, they feel that they are getting loss of their privileges, and so the symptoms actually can uh, recur. That also is observed after epilepsy surgery. When a patient with refractory epilepsy undergo surgery and they actually improve, they develop PNES. Right. So again, something I thought uh, be, should be helpful to all general neurologists in their practice. I, I thank you for, for the opportunity uh, to both MDSI and uh, IN for uh, this session. Alenia, thank, thank you so much. The last presentation is by Dr. Neeraj Pumar from who is the ex-executive of the uh, MDSI. Uh, I request Nearest to present his case. Just a second, sir. I will just share the slide. Um, uh, is it visible, sir? Uh, yes. Fine. Yeah. So, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Surya, Dr. UMS, uh, Dr. Rishi and the entire IAN MDSI team uh, for uh, bringing forward this program and uh, giving me the opportunity to be uh, to present the case. So I will be presenting three uh, cases quickly. I mean, the, the few of the rare movement disorders and I think uh, uh, this case probably will start with a small case one. And this is a 65 year old uh, gentleman. Uh, uh, and uh, he had gait ataxia at 55, started dropping things at 58 and was wheelchair bound by 64. And uh, we'll just go through the video. And uh, he had some dysarthric speech and a vertical supranuclear gaze palsy. The systemic examination was normal. <laughs> And at the same time, we will see as he goes through this test and he has a bit of myoclonus as well as some ataxia there. So this is 55. 
year old and uh, this is a 64 year a 65 year old gentleman with a history of almost 10 year duration and we could see the gaze palsy especially the vertical gaze palsy so this is again a supranuclear gaze palsy as we could see here and the investigation the routine lab investigations were normal the ataxia panel was negative and uh, the brain mri showed uh, some mid atrophy in the midbrain and the cortex and uh, considering although uh, with all the routine tests coming to be uh, non conclusive and uh, we go, went through the uh, NPC, there is a NPC suspicion index, which was uh, uh, in the suspicious range and the genetic test revealed po positive test for the NPC1 gene and patient uh, did respond uh, to valproate as far as the myoclonic jerks were con uh, concerned. Miglustad was started and was titrated to the maximum possible dose of 200 milligram BID. And this is something which was a case which uh, we I followed when I was in Canada. So this is uh, some uh, Miglustad uh, uh, is not available as far as to my knowledge in India. So what are the important learnings from this case? The late age of onset of NPC, as Dr. Paul has nicely discussed in the rare movement disorder lecture, uh, that there can mostly the cases are earlier, but we should suspect cases even later in the age, usually in 40s and 50s. Myoclonus is uncommon, but then yes, it can be found. And then all the more common disorders at 65 like PSP should be suspected, but NPC should also be considered in a differential diagnosis, especially in pertinent clinical situation. And uh, I'm not going to go through this as Dr. Paul has already discussed. This is interesting as far as the Neiman Pick C is concerned. So the systemic involvement and uh, the neurological involvement, which involves both psychiatric and uh, cognitive as well as the uh, neurological uh, involvement. So usually depending on the age, it has been classified into five types, the perinatal, then early infantile, late infantile, juvenile, and adult. So most of the patients, they are falling in the uh, early age group. And there are very few reports which uh, say about the late onset uh, Neiman Pixie. So uh, this is what I would like to uh, uh, request all the listeners to take home the NPC suspicion index because this basically helps us to really narrow down and this is a score which was uh, uh, started uh, which was initially formulated by Be uh, Bezwerg et al in 2012 and it has got some uh, indicators the clinical indicators the very strong indicators are the vertical supranuclear gaze palsy and gelastic cataplexy and then there are some strong indicators especially the visceral ones and some moderate indicators, some weak and some ancillary. So this you can easily do a scoring here. And if the score comes to 70 or more, then it is highly favorable to get the NPC testing done. And uh, if it is 40 to uh, 69, then it is suspicious and then below 40 is really negative. So this is something which probably will be the take home message for this case. And coming on to the case. Two. So this is an interesting case, which uh, I saw here a uh, couple of years back, a nine year old boy born from a non consanguineous uh, marriage uh, with normal birth and developmental history. And he presented with acute onset illness uh, where uh, and it was preceded by fever and had repeated episodes of seizures, right focal with secondary generalization. Each episode lasted uh, each, each episode uh, was there uh, for a few minutes and then with, had some intact interictal awareness. The sensorium <coughs> started fluctuating over the past 25 days and he was being fed with NG tube. There were crying spells which he developed over the past 20 days before he presented to us. And although he was quite uh, aware, he would open his eyes and would enjoy the music or video which was in played over the phone. So this is actually a video. Uh, this is actually the boy. And as you see, he has improved quite tremendously on the therapy which we gave. So I will just go through what exactly did we suspect. 
and how did the patient improved so this is a sequence of videos combined into one where we could see the boy improving from a bed bound state to almost uh, coming to a near normal and so he is doing quite well so this was the investigation panel which we did so almost everything was negative the metabolic workup was also negative and this was what we found on the mri the solen basically ganglia and i think uh, dr paul did discuss this disorder and this is biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglia disease unfortunately we could not get the genetic test for the slc 19a3 done but then that didn't deter us from trying the patient on high dose of biotin and thiamine and uh, you could see the result uh... so what are the important learnings from this case a trial of high dose of biotin and thiamine must be tried in kids especially in age group 3 to 10 years when a, a patient is uh, when a child is presenting with acute or subacute encephalopathy preceded by febrile illness or some other stress and the brain mri is uh, showing swell, swelling and t2 flare hyperintensity in bilateral basal ganglia so i think probably this is uh, touching one of the points which pankaj also highlighted in his presentation so i think this is uh, this is uh, another take home message i would suggest for our uh, neurologists and uh, uh, neurologist friends then this is another case case 3 so we could we just saw uh, how a vitamin helped in a genetic condition uh, this is something quite interesting again a 36 year old male chronic alcoholic or with the last with the last intake almost uh, 20 days back he presented with irrelevant talk and slurred speech in the psychiatry opd gait imbalance was there so there was some deterioration in sensorium and uh, abnormal head neck and limb movements and uh, this is what he had so this was what at the day of admission and uh, we were immediately called by the psychiatry team and uh, As we examined the patient, patient was looking to be delirious at the same time. The history was very typical as a uh, patient was having a uh, gait imbalance almost 10 days uh, <clears throat> and then had deteriorating sensorium and delirium. And this is something which we tried. And uh, before that, I will just go to the next slide. So this was what the MRI was showing extensive corpus callosum involvement with t2 and flare hyperintensity and involving the genu body and splenium with significant diffusion restriction and i think most of the most of us would realize the diagnosis so it was a markia fava, fava big nami disease and i gave high dose of iv thiamine and five days pulse of methyl prednisolone so the patient improved significantly and this is something which is uh, quite interesting as most of the patients with uh, uh, markia fava big nami usually they don't have a very good outcome so this was on day 10 of the therapy at three months follow up so his doing quite well for someone who was literally bedridden with the mark of our big nami so he's he's doing quite well so so the important learnings from this case that near complete and this you can see the mri uh, which we repeated at three months so it showed near complete uh, resolution the near complete clinical recovery of patient was something which was quite interesting and motivating for us and with normalization of the MRI uh, brain. So uh, the learning point uh, here will be uh, that Markia Fava Big Nami forms a differential of acute onset ataxia and rigidity with deteriorating sensorium in a chronic alcoholic patient that most of us know and we didn't wait for the MRI and usually uh, if uh, we see such patients of course most of us do that we give a high dose of thiamine and uh, that is what did the trick for this patient so rare movement disorders are not always untreatable and when treatable it is highly satisfying so this is what the message I would leave you with and thank you all for this uh, giving me the opportunity to make this 10 minute presentation thank you Thank you, Dr. Niraz.
fantastic cases, good learning cases. And as you said, we have to always point our attention towards treatability, whatever the cause be. And there are cases of rare movement disorders and make a good point of it. Thank you, sir. Do you have a question? Uh, Dr. Niraj? Yes, sir. Actually, it's a the, thank you for a very nice case. But when I was seeing the case, I was thinking about whether we are dealing with Warnix and Solopathy. But the point is that there was no ophthalmoparesis. So yes, yes, that sir. actually differentiates. But, but otherwise, you know, ataxia, confusion, yes, everything yes, fits sir. into Warnix and yes, Solopathy. Yes. Actually, sir, the MRI film was uh, very typically uh, Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. But in the, without uh, MRI, we would have administered thiamine in this case. <laughs> Anyhow, that's the yes, thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Exactly. And actually, sir, probably high dose of thiamine probably is the trick here. Of yes. course, I think most of us do use thiamine, but then probably these patients are well uh, uh, taken care of by a high dose of thiamine. So right. that was something which I wanted to highlight. Beautiful case. First time I have seen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So... Dr. Mar, uh, I think from the chairperson side, uh, uh, I really thank uh, the IN as well as MDSI team for giving us opportunity to chair the session and fantastic learning. I think the uh, audience also would have enjoyed. Achal, sir, anything? Would yes, like? it was a, uh, I, I would say, very nice two hours. Everyone enjoyed and uh, we did see uh, those uh, um Rare cases, but of course, where could we could do something? Otherwise, uh, everyone knows that uh, in degenerative diseases, uh, the outcome is not very good. Thank you so much to all the speakers, and I hand over the uh, proceedings to Dr. Rishi again. Thank you very much. Uh, we largely kept with the time, and all three presentations were wonderful. And after the cases were wonderful. So the, I think purpose itself uh, is solved. Uh, may I request Dr. Neval Surya to give uh, concluding remarks, if he's around. Uh, thank you, Rishi Kes. Uh, thank yes, you, all the speaker. I think it was a wonderful session, uh, though it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, more time for a normal person, but two hours, 15 minutes, uh, wonderful session, great cases. The most important thing is wonderful rare cases and uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation by all the three speakers. So I thank uh, Movement Disorder Society for uh, organizing this joint meeting, in particular recent case. And uh, uh, Achal and uh, Ravi has joined as a part of a uh, subsection of Indian Academy of Neurology. Uh, once again, thanks to the President, Dr. Bo, and I hope that we will have continue to have similar uh, episodes uh, and sessions in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So we'll, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll close it. Thank you.